for inviting us and uh, for having us. It's always special for us to present here at Prairie Women because only because Omar is our home, but also because this way can really share with the community and connect with you and show you some of the work we do uh, around here. So definitely uh, what we do wouldn't be possible without a huge team, Mesa Grass and National <coughs> as well as a long list of contributors, volunteers, and partners. So our first slide is really to acknowledge and thank all these people. <clears throat> um, there will be several topics that we'll be discussing today. And so this is really to give you a quick outline uh, of what's going to be covered in the next 15 minutes or so. And as Kidding says, I will be happy and encourage you to ask any question, but keep them until the end, I will be able to answer them. We work in the most endangered biome in the world. That's what uh, temperate grasslands are. Um, it's more or less, uh, temperate grasslands cover 8% of the global land cover. However, uh, only 5% actually falls within protected areas. Uh, we all are sitting in the Northern Great Plains. And it's, uh, just as a reference, it's estimated that roughly 30% of the Northern Great Plains today retains the natural vegetation. And if we actually move a little bit uh, closer to where we are, uh, it's estimated that uh, more than 80% of the native prairie for Saskatchewan has been already been lost. And in this sense, Grasslands National Park really protects and represents one of the best examples of the remaining uh, mist grass prairie ecosystem in Canada. For whoever is not familiar with grasslands, we are located in southern Saskatchewan, the border with Montana, and we cover an area of roughly 900 square kilometers. Um, because it's uh, uh, an ecosystem at risk, this is really a place for species at risk. Uh, we currently count up to 24 species that are federally listed, and we actually expect more to be added to this list in the next few years. 
Now, um, in 2016, Deep Park uh, approved a management plan for multiple species at risk. Um, through this plan, we identified population and uh, distribution objectives for several species at risk. Um, Often, this population distribution objectives actually reflect national population distribution objectives that will uh, help us to work towards um, larger, basically, uh, goals um, assessed by the coverage strategy or other management plan, so basically legal documents that are guiding us. Uh, once these population distribution objectives are identified, our commitment is, on behalf of Canadian, to implement actions on the ground for the recovery of species at risk and monitor the status and the trend of population against those population distribution objectives that were set for the site. Now, in a park that has so many species at risk, uh, for effective conservation we really need to follow an ecosystem approach. And usually there are really two key species that we work on that are really functional to this approach. Uh, one is the greater sage grouse. This is a landscape and an umbrella species, which means that it uses large and diverse areas, and that by protecting the complex mosaic of sagebrush, insect, and four bridge habitat that the species requires, we are indirectly benefiting many other species that belong to the same ecological community. The other species is the black tailed prairie dog. Uh, this is a keystone species, which means that it's predated by a variety of predators, such as ferruginous hawks. Blackfooted ferrets, badger, coyotes, free rattlesnakes, and also provides shelter or nesting opportunities for vertebrates and invertebrates. Uh, Grasslands National, Grasslands National Park has a very particular commitment and responsibility towards these two species. And that's because, in case of various sage grouse, we are one of the only two sites in Canada that host these uh, species, the other being uh, southeastern Ontario. And for blackberry prairie dog, our commitment, if you want, is even stronger because we are the only site across the country that hosts a population for these species. So for all these reasons, uh, in the past few years, we have input a lot of effort and resources for the protection and recovery of these species. However, we don't forget and we don't want others to forget that we also have many other species at risk that we are committed to uh, protect monitor and recover. And today's presentation is really uh, focused on the, those are other species. And these are the four species that we selected for today's presentation. And we will be talking about. So the speaker will be um, Michelle, who is going to talk about the one of the most beloved species in Gasson that's the right now. Please welcome Michelle. So as I said, they prefer to nest on the prairie dog colonies, and that's where we start. We, uh, the owls arrive in early April and start nesting in mid-May. So we search the colonies from a distance using binoculars and spotting scopes, and try to spot movement and anything that looks like an owl. So even with a spotting scope, it can be really hard to spot the owls. 
If they're not moving, it's hard to distinguish an owl from a rock or a clump of dirt. There's a pair right there. Um, so we're really lucky that we have two expert volunteers that have been coming out for 20 years to help with these surveys. And that's them right there, Jen. Mm -hmm. um, some of the nesting behaviors that we look for when we're doing these surveys are um, owls repeatedly entering the same burrow, uh, bringing back nesting material to the burrow, um, territorial behaviors such as chasing off other owls, and of course, population. Some of the physical signs that we look for to uh, suggest that a burrow is being used as a nest are scat and manure scattered around the burrow entrance, uh, fresh owl pellets and whitewash around the burrow, and breast feathers, and sometimes we'll even see prey remains like little bird feathers or mammal bones um, or insect parts. Once we know where the nest is, we attempt to get two mid-clutch egg counts. And to do this, we use a keeping camera, which is essentially a camera at the end of a long, flexible hose that we can insert into the burrow to get a visual of the nest. It's not always possible to see the nest. Sometimes... Hang on, hang on one sec, and we'll just let these guys come in and sit down, and then you don't have to... No one has to go... <laughs> Um, if you, wherever you want to put your chairs to, maybe you want to, there. There's more chairs over here as well. I can put this one into it. Are there? Up yeah, there? there's up a few as there. well. Okay. Everyone to be comfortable. Thank you. be able to hear all this. All right, sorry. There's two more right here. Yeah, there's also two in front. Okay. without risking damage to the eggs, and sometimes the female's already incubating. Uh, in which case she's blocking our view and there's nothing we can do. Um, to minimize the impact of this peeping on the owls, we limit the number of attempts to two. And we do it very slowly and very carefully uh, to not damage the burrow or the eggs. Uh, research has shown that if done carefully enough, the peeping does not have any impact on the reproductive output of the owls, and it doesn't cause them to abandon the nest. So far, we haven't seen any nests fail or be abandoned because of this, but it's something that we continue to watch out for, just in case. Now, if we're able to get a count of the eggs, we use this count to estimate the initiation date of the nest and also the hatch date. And the reason we want this information is we want to start feeding the owls as soon as they hatch to maximize the benefit. We also need this because we have to do our brood counts between 26 and 40 days post-hatch. So 14 days after they hatch, the owlets should start emerging from the burrow, and they look kind of like that, kind of um, ugly cute. <laughs> um, so we set up a nest, a nest check camera at this point. And the photos from these cameras tell us whether the outlets really are emerging. And if they are, we can kind of estimate the age. Some of the indicators that we look for are how much down the outlets have, how developed the primary flight feathers and the tail feathers are. And we also look at behavior, such as wing flapping, self-feeding, and breeding. And uh, this age information also gives us a better idea of exactly when they hatch. These cameras are also pretty cool. Oh, man. <laughs> because we get to see some really neat species interactions. Um, so I'm going to just show a couple of examples. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the most interesting things that we've seen. This is four badgers trying to get into a burrow. And uh, as you can see, the owl is pissed. <laughs> In this situation, the owl actually was able to chase off the badgers, and the nest did survive. So 26 to 40 days after they hatch, we try to get a count of the, of the owlets. 
and we use two methods to do this to ensure accuracy. Uh, our first method is that our volunteers, Jeff and Helen, come back and they do a visual count. And the visual count is done in the exact same way as the nest searches. They sit up on the hill for hours and try and count the, the juveniles. Our second method is to set up a camera again and try and get a count from the photos. So in this photo we've got eight juveniles here and both adults. So on average the visual counts tend to get a higher count, but there have been cases where our cameras get a higher number of outlets than the visual counts. So it's important that we do both methods. So on top of monitoring the population, we also do supplementary feeding of the owls. Um, research has found that if you provide the owls with additional food during the brood rearing phase, it hugely increases the number of juveniles that survive to fledge. So each nest that we find in the spring, we provide with 14 frozen mice twice a week, or 28 frozen mice a week, for seven weeks starting on the hatch date. Uh, to put this into perspective, this year we walked 120 kilometers over 38 days to distribute over 2,000 frozen mice. Um, but the supplemental feeding is just that. It's a supplement to their natural diet and they do still have to hunt. So to meet their energy requirements, they'll catch insects such as crickets, grasshoppers, and beetles. They'll get small mammals like mice and voles, and sometimes even amphibians, such as frogs and salamanders. Basically anything small enough that they can catch. So, for the past nine years, the numbers of burrowing owl breeding pairs in the park has been fairly consistent. And um, while we haven't seen an increase like we would love to see, this is actually a huge success when you consider that in other areas of Saskatchewan, the population is still declining by about 22% per year. So just the fact that we're remaining stable is great. And you may notice that um, in the last three years, the years that we've been feeding the owls, we're not seeing an increase in the number of breeding pairs coming back. So you might wonder, is the feeding actually working? But as you can see, if you compare the nest that we did feed with the nest that we found too late in the season and didn't feed, um, you can see the difference that we're making. So the fed nests average about 6.3 fledglings, while the nests that we don't feed average 4.4. And in this graph, you can see that in the three years that we've been feeding these owls, we've seen some of our highest numbers of fledglings per nest since we started monitoring in 1998. So that's pretty great. Um, and some people might wonder uh, if it's really a good idea for us to be feeding the owls and interfering in that way. Uh, we usually discourage feeding wildlife. But this is a really special circumstance. Uh, the average owl family in Saskatchewan only has four owlets and of those, 55% will survive to fledge. So if they have four outlets, and maybe two of them will make it to migrate south for the first winter. Whereas here, in the three years that we've been feeding, we have an average of about six outlets fledge. And sometimes we even have broods as high as nine fledglings, which is something you just don't see anywhere else. Um, yeah. So even though the juveniles may not be returning exactly here to breed in future years, it's still, we can still see that we're measurably increasing uh, the amount of juveniles joining the population. So yeah, in my eyes, that's a win. And up next, Laura is going to tell us a little bit about greater short term lizards. Afterwards, 
So starting with the lizard, um, shorthorn lizards are Saskatchewan's only lizard species, and they are listed as endangered on the Species at Risk Act. And over 90% of Saskatchewan's lizard population is within the boundaries of Grasslands National Park. Um, and their habitat within the park has a very patchy distribution. Um, so this is a picture of their habitat here. Um, it's got this sort of light gray, light to almost like kitty litter like soil that's mosaic with patches of horizontal juniper. Um, and the lizards also like other types of structure, like rocks, um, other <coughs> shrub species, forbs, um, anything that gives them that variety of different microclimates that they can use. Um, and the way that we survey the habitat is we go with four or five people uh, to a patch, we try to spread out in a line and move together uh, systematically through that habitat patch. And what we're looking for is the lizards themselves, of course, but also indications of their presence, such as their poop, which looks kind of like this. <coughs> Once a lizard is found, we handle the lizards very quickly to take morphometric measurements just to confirm uh, age and sex of the animals very fast. Wow. Um, so this is a map of the west block of the park. This is how we uh, divided up the areas to search them. So every colored polygon on here represents a patch of lizard habitat in the West Block of the Park. Um, we took those patches, we divided them into one by one kilometer squares, and then we did a random selection on those squares um, to decide where we were going to do our monitoring within those patches. And then the random selection squares are the ones with these sort of hash pattern in them. Um, and then within those squares, we were trying to detect occupancy of lizards and therefore occupancy of these larger patches. So the ones that we did this year are these five that are highlighted in red in the northwest area of the park here. So just some brief uh, results of what we got. We had 15 <laughs> surveyors out. Uh, we searched a total distance of 93.4 kilometers looking for lizards. Uh, we found a total of nine adults, so this is four males and five females, uh, 16 young of the year, 10 males and 6 females, two that are categorized as unknown because we couldn't handle them for some reason, um, for a total of 27 lizards. And if you divide that by per search area, that's 0.29 lizards per kilometer. Um, so using this method, we were able to confirm occupancy in four out of those five boxes. So moving on to Eastern Yellowbelly Racer. So this species is listed as threatened on the Species at Risk Act. There is over 70% of its distribution in Canada is within Grasslands National Park. So again, we have um, a pretty big responsibility to monitor for and manage for this species. Rattlesnakes are also being considered uh, to be listed under the Species at Risk Act. So it's important for us to get baseline information on this species as well in particular. So snakes in the park um, hibernate over the winter in winter hibernacula. Um, they're typically in south-facing bluffs of river valleys, like shown here, uh, where snakes are able to use mammal burrows to get below the frost line and survive over the winter. Um, sites that are actually suitable enough for the snakes to survive our harsh winters are really limited in the park. Um, so this forces multiple species of snakes to hibernate together. They really have no choice if they want to survive. Um, so in the spring, all of these species emerge out of hibernation altogether, and that creates a really unique opportunity uh, for the park to get that snapshot of what our snake population looks like in the park. So which dens are active, which dens have which species, who's where. So some of the species that we have in the park, and therefore the ones we expect to see in our monitoring is the plains garter snake, identifiable by this bright orange uh, stripe seen along the back. The eastern yellow belly racer, kind of same body shape as garter snake, but there's no identifiable markings on it really. There's no stripes, no spots, no anything. They're just kind of a solid brown to olive green color with this bright yellow belly you can kind of see peeking out here. Uh, the bull snake has kind of a light brown background with dark brown or black saddles on it. Um, but also kind of has quite a bit of speckling along the top as well. Rattlesnakes, identifiable by the rattle if you can see it, but also um, diamond-shaped head or this 
a noticeable pit gland here. Smooth green snakes, these have only been um, confirmed in the east block of the park, so not in the west block where we conducted our monitoring, but uh, we do have them, and they're the only ones that are that fluorescent green coloring. This is the western terrestrial garter snake. Um, we actually don't have any confirmations of this species in the park yet, but they are in other areas of the Frenchman River Valley, particularly near East End, um, so it is possible that they could be here. And then the western hognose, which is another species that we've only confirmed in the east block of the park, not the west block. Um, so we're also we're interested in any of those species, of course, but we're also interested in the different age classes of snakes that we have in the park. So when snakes are in their juvenile stage, a lot of them can look really similar. They're all kind of black and speckly and trying to blend into their surroundings. Um, racers in particular can be complex because they look different when they're juvenile and when they're an adult. So these top two pictures are actually both eastern yellow-bellied racer. Uh, this one is a juvenile in its first year. It's very gray with those dark brown saddles. Um, the one on the right, you can see it's starting to get that adult coloration. So it's got that kind of um, greenish brownish back. You can see the yellow belly coming in, but it's got these kind of brown orangish speckling. That's just some reminiscence of the dark brown saddling pattern. And eventually it will um, gain that full adult coloration. So in this study, we were calling these ones juveniles, and these ones sub-adults. Um, this lower left picture is a juvenile bull snake, and then on the right, a juvenile rattlesnake. Um, again, very similar, but slightly different. The rattlesnake has this more defined diamond-shaped head, and you can see the little rattle on the end of the tail, too. Um, so the way that we did our monitoring was we chose 15 dens in the park that are part of this monitoring program, and we do three to four dens per year over a five-year rotation schedule. And we set up trail cameras like this at entrances um, to the dens in the park, and we left them up for about three days each. If snakes were detected on the cameras, we called it good and pulled the cameras in, but if, um, if we didn't get any occupancy, then we'd leave them up for another three days until we got something. So here's some of the results that we got from the trail cameras. It was mostly plain garter snake, uh, with identifiable again by this bright orange stripe down the back. Adult racers, the snake's right here. Even though this is only part of the snake, you can tell it's a racer because there's no markings on it whatsoever. There's no stripes, spots, saddles, nothing. It's just a solid brown greenish color. You can kind of see the yellow belly peeking out here. So this was the second most common snake that we got. Uh, juvenile racers, this one's quite small, it's hiding right in here, looks like a little worm, um, kind of a grey, beige-ish background colour with that, those small dark brown speckles. This is what I was saying before, a sub-adult racer, so you can see that it does look the greenish brown colour, and but there's that yellow belly sticking out here, and I don't know if you can really see, but there's some slight brown speckling on this area of the body, so that individual is in transition from that juvenile phase to the adult phase. So this is a sub-adult. We also got some multi-species photos that were really cool. Um, you can see the plains garter snake again with the orange stripe. This is an adult rattlesnake. Even though you can't see the rattle, um, you can see that diamond-shaped head, and if you were able to zoom in on this picture, um, you'd see there's a distinctive pit gland right inside the face there. Um, we had some multi-individual photos. Sometimes it's hard to tell how many snakes were in a pile. Um, one surefire way is either count the heads or count the tails, right? So in this one you can see there's two rattlesnake heads right there. Um, a few with multiple racers in them, distinguishable again by that bright yellow belly. Some snakes taking selfies with the camera. <laughs> 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 This is actually a pretty good picture. You can see the distinctive pit gland right there. So that's how we know that one's a rattlesnake. And then they can't see the rest of them. Um, so I put this one in here to show not all of our hibernacular burrows are super obvious and open and easy to see exactly what species it is. There's quite a few that are completely occluded by vegetation. Um, great for the snakes, more difficult for us. So there is actually a snake in this picture. 
you haven't seen it yet, is right in here. You can just see the body coming out of the burrow there. Um, there's dark brown saddles, beige background, and a lot of black speckling around the edge of the saddles. So that one's an adult bull snake. <clears throat> so just some brief monitoring results. Using this method, we got about 200,000 photos that we sorted through. Gave us 118 snake detections. Um, and we were able to confirm occupancy at three out of the four dens that we monitored this year. Most common species was Plains garter snake again, um, 54 adults, followed by racer, uh, 34 adults, three of those sub-adult transition stages, and two juveniles. Um, rattlesnakes, we had 22 adults and two juveniles, and then we recorded one bull snake, which was the one I showed you the picture. So although it's great, we detected occupancy in the park, the snakes are still using the dens, they're still there, but there's still a number of threats to their existence in the park. And one of those threats is road mortality, and that's going to be the focus of our next talk. Excellent. transportation is to human society, there has always been consequences. And the devastating effects of human wildlife collisions is nothing new to any of us. Within Grasslands National Park are high numbers of species at risk exasperate the situation, as all our hard work can be for naught in one unfortunate moment. As part of our multi-species action plan, a traffic management strategy has been initiated to mitigate the danger for humans and wildlife when they meet on the road. In this undertaking, the first step was to understand the problem. Why are these collisions happening? One reason is that the wildlife are being attracted to the road for natural food that grows along the roadway, or the remains of previous road mortalities. Some wildlife come to the roads for the higher elevation and the vantage point it provides for the surrounding areas. While in the case of reptiles, they can be attracted to the radiant heat. We must also consider that there are natural wildlife corridors in the park and that the road may transact them. However, not all roads are equal. As the western half of the park receives far more visitors than the eastern backcountry roads, there we go. So, mo oh. there we go. most visitors travel the eco tour loop. They come through here and they'll go back around. So the western portion of the park is going to receive far more visitors than the backcountry. Uh, also, some roads are just far more dangerous than others simply based off their design. A curve in the road is one of the most dangerous places to meet a wild animal, as the, animal, as the animal cannot anticipate your direction of travel. Then, add some ups and downs and some high vegetation along roadways that block sight lines, and you have a very dangerous situation. Furthermore, within the park, the road is owned by the municipality, meaning we cannot legally enforce speed limits. And as I'll show you, when vehicles travel down at a high rate of speed, they enter the park and they do not modify their speed, and they reach a prairie dog colony, that can have devastating effects from that colony. So, 2016 was our first year of monitoring, our year one, our base data. Each year since then, we have asked all staff and partners of Grasslands National Park to keep an eye out for road mortalities. GPS locations, the date, and what species it was are noted and relayed back to me so I can populate a database. The remains are either moved to a safe location where they can be consumed by scavengers or collected for our disease sampling program. We were able to accumulate historical records on, from other databases going back to 1995 but as they were all incidental records, we weren't able to paint an accurate picture of what was going on out there. I do want to point out some heartbreaking uh, records, such as the Swift Fox and the Black-Footed Fair. So, looking at the data gathered over the past three years, we can see what species are really being affected by vehicle collisions. 
namely black-tailed prairie dogs, which is in ground squirrels and plains garter snakes. Although I want to highlight that a third of all our detected road mortality in the past three years have been species of risk, and that number may rise as other species are listed. So using our 2016 data, road mortality hotspots were identified using spatial analysis. As you can see, Ecotour, uh, Bells of Day Use, Frenchman Valley Campground, uh, the Larson Colony and the Walker Colony were found to be the most at risk for wildlife collisions. So in, in mitigating road mortalities, the first response and the easiest is to educate the public. For all the reasons I listed before, wildlife can show up on the road when you least expect it. So in communicating that risk to visitors, they become aware, they slow down, and the risk is, is greatly reduced. There were, several, there were several factors that had to be considered when deciding how that communication would happen. It needed to be relevant and specific. If you ask people to slow down over a vast length of road and they don't see anything, or they forget that they saw the sign, they're going to speed up again. So our signs needed to be targeted at our identified hotspots and needed to be the ability to move as those hotspots moved. The signs also needed to abide by our Greater Sage Coast Emergency Protection Order, which states that we can't put up structures above 1.2 meters. We also had to consider that the signs need to be durable enough to withstand bison that would love to rub on them and the strong winds of the prairies. Thus, we decided to utilize wind signs they could rock with bison or wind and be moved anywhere we needed them. The 30 kilometer an hour speed limit was found to be an acceptable speed where a driver had enough time to identify the snake, prairie dog, or other small animal and safely stop their vehicle without putting humans or wildlife at risk. So based off the hotspots that we identified in 2016, wind signs were first deployed in the spring of 2017 and were utilized again in 2018. In order to limit the amount of signage on the landscape, key hotspots were identified that would target the largest risks and provide the greatest return. Here you can see Eco Tour Colony, the Frenchman Valley Campground, Larson Colony, and Walker Colony have been determined as high risk. So using 2016 as our control year, when we monitor but no signs were present, we can see that since we've introduced signs almost across the board, we've had a decrease in collisions. However, we can see that signs were far more effective in 2018 down here than 2017. So why was that? Considering the park as a whole, this chart shows road mortalities compared to visitor numbers going back to 1995. As I mentioned before, data before 2016 was mostly incidental, with the exception of 2009, uh, when the Royal Saskatchewan Museum did a survey of snake road mortalities in the park and surrounding areas. As you can see, in recent years we've had a steady increase in visitor numbers, peaking in 2017 when the park was heavily advertised. Focusing on recent years, we can see how higher visitor numbers line up with higher mortality numbers. 2017 had over twice as many road mortalities than 2016, resulting from 4,000 more visitors. If we accept, accept that this is not a normal occurrence, we can see that even with 2,000 more visitors in 2018, there we go, in 2018 and 2016, we're, even with 2,000 more visitors in 2018 than 2016, we were able to contain road mortalities at around 60 deaths, while decreasing species at risk loss by 40% by using signage. So, looking at this slide again, we can focus on 2016 versus 2018, which had much more similar visitor numbers. And we can see how the signs have drastically decreased mortalities in those hotspots. To show you what this looks like on the ground, in 2016 we see our base data, Eco Tour Colony, the Frenchman Valley Campground, and Bells of Day Use areas, Larson, Larson Colony and Walker Colony are all large and well-defined. In 2017, you can see that Ecotour Colony has actually gotten worse. It's a darker shade of red now. 
and the Frenchman Valley campground area has shifted more to focus on the actual campground. What I call police over here is the entrance to police coolie calling has become more distinguished and Dixon West has popped up. However, Larson Colony looks a lot better and the Locker Colony disappeared altogether. In 2018, we start to see the fruits of our labor. Ecotour is looking a lot better. It's just a light green now. The campground has been greatly reduced, a lot smaller, and Larson, Larson Colony isn't showing up at all. So, looking at these numbers, you see the actual numbers that we had in each one of those by a year. So did this management strategy work? Absolutely, but the signs are only the first step. As more people hear about the beauty of Grasslands National Park, our visitor numbers will increase, and we need to be ready with more permanent communication. Uh, we need permanent signage and locations that will always be at risk, such as EcoTour, increased communications in the campground, continued monitoring and identification of hotspots as they appear, and dedicated efforts towards snakes, for as we saw, most of our mortalities were mammals, but reptiles are even more vulnerable. Identifying reptile hotspots and utilizing wildlife road crossings are a necessity of maintaining healthy reptile populations in the future. And then I'll pass it off to Stephanie for you. Okay, so the last item on our list from species um, are bats. So, in this year, <clears throat> we started a monitoring program for bats in the park. Uh, our focus was to build brown libraries. However, we also wanted to uh, um, obtain in the long term um, an inventory of the species of bats present in the park. Uh, for this reason, we use a variety of tools and methods in combination. <clears throat> Now, the little brown myote is, is um, listed as endangered on the species of risk factor. And this is primarily due to uh, a huge decline that is happening at the continental scale uh, due to disease. The disease we are talking about <coughs> is the white nose syndrome. Uh, this is a disease of hibernating bats. Um, basically, it shows up as a fungal infection, uh, white fungus. You can see in this slide here uh, on the muzzle of the bat also in the wings and other parts of the body. And basically, uh, diseased bats um, act very strangely during hibernation. Uh, they tend to fly outside of their uh, hibernating sites. Uh, they tend to cluster nearby the entrances of the hibernation site. And as a consequence, there's huge mortality recorded. And we are talking about up to 90 or 100% of mortality in an infected hibernating site. Basically, it's the equivalent of plague into the bat world. Um, and in fact, by 2018, um, we have pretty much over 34 states in the United States that uh, have been affected and five provinces in Canada. And the disease is spreading very quickly westwards. Um, so much that is actually estimated that by 2028, all the sites in Canada that do have uh, little brown areas will be infected. Uh, however, the good news is that uh, Saskatchewan is not uh, infected yet at this stage, and this is an excellent timing for us to acquire baseline information on the uh, different species present in the park to understand what will be the impact of the disease and what management options, if any, we do have. <clears throat> now, um, in Brasmus National Park, we do have, uh, maybe a surprise for some of you, um, some good, very good sites for um, roosting and for little brown bats. In fact, this is one of the few species that uses anthropogenic structures for um, maternal roosts. Talking about old buildings, yard site, barns, shacks, uh, bridges. So um, these are all great sites that we could actually monitor. Um, now the important thing is that little brown myotis shows a very strong site fidelity, which means that once one of these sites is established as a maternal roost, they can return for decades and using the same roost. So although we did have some occasional um, record of bats presence in the park, we, did, we really did not have any baseline information on any maternal roost in the area. As you can imagine, knowing where one of these buildings is used by bats 
very important for party management because in that way you can actually um, inform decision making with respect to building the commissioning and ensure that the site occupancy is maintained in the long term. Now, what we did this summer, for the first time, we actually started doing building inspections looking for bats. So we did the inspection at eight, 18 buildings at 12 different sites, and we were able to either find the bats itself, or look for feces that were a good track of bats being there. So out of the 12, uh, 18 buildings and 12 sites, we had confirmation or suspicion of bats being present at 9 of them. So in the cases where we could only find guano, which means bird, uh, bat feces, we actually collect the guano and we'll be analyzing uh, through DNA testing to confirm the species identity. <clears throat> we also do acoustic monitoring. So we deploy bat detectors uh, in five sites, selecting sites that are very promising for bat activity, such as water bodies or coolies or uh, nearby buildings. And we recorded over 6,000 uh, bat passes, and we were able to identify diagnostic calls for up to six species, such as little brown maiores, the long-eared maiores, the big brown bat, the silver-haired bat, the hoary bat, and the eastern flat bat. Finally, we also did misnetting, so captures of bats. And we worked uh, over five nights, again, choosing sites that are highly promising for bat activities, such as foraging sites over water or creek. And um, we were able to capture over 64 individuals belonging to four different species, uh, including little brown maiores, long gear maiores, uh, the big brown bat, and the western small footed maiores. Now, putting together all this different data, what we obtain is a snapshot of what happens in Grasslands National Park. We identify one maternity roost for little brown maiores in the park, as well as one maternity roost for the big brown bat. And finally, we have a total of seven different species of bat in the park, uh, which are listed over here. And uh, I think among these, it's quite important to notice a couple. The small footed myotis will actually uh, represent an expansion of the known range of the species in Canada. And because of the high number of calls and movements that we detected over migration season, we actually think that the park is a potential corridor, migrating corridor, for uh, the hoary bat and the eastern red bat from Saskatchewan into Montana. Now, uh, it's time to wrap up our presentation. So, I guess what I want to leave you with is that although we um, really, as you can see, try uh, and put a lot of efforts into uh, monitoring and active management, there's still a long ways to go. Um, and much more that needs to be done to protect uh, this very sensitive landscape. And um, building on our efforts, we are really trying to move towards a uh, park-wide ecosystem approach uh, for multiple species of risk. Examples include, for example, the uh, management of a bison conservation herd, uh, expansion of beneficial cattle grazing um, to optimize habitat for upland songbird species such as uh, spade pipits and chestnut cord lumber. The use of prescribed fire to manage invasive plant species as well as optimizing species at risk habitat. And finally, uh, using a landscape scale approach to habitat management for those keystone and umbrella species like uh, the black tail prey dog and the rare seashells. And with that, uh, we will be very happy to take any questions uh, in our first. Thank you very much. presenters. What an amazing presentation. Hey, eh? the images were fantastic. Um, it was really great. Um, I also want to thank this team here too for their hard work for the conservation of species at risk. You may have noticed from the presentation they spent a lot of time hiking, hundreds of kilometers. What they don't tell you is it's like 40 degrees out and crazy wind and they're doing this early in the morning and long days and late at night. So let's have a round of applause for this awesome team. Um, your camera, I know that it's a motion sensor, but is it also a motion sensor for the snakes? Because uh, they don't always move a lot. Um, yeah, so sometimes, like the cameras are set on really high sensitivity, but okay. you're right, the snakes, they move so slow, 
that sometimes it doesn't trigger it. So we have that active, and then there's another mode on the camera that you can set um, that it takes one picture every minute. Okay. And I had it set from like 10 o'clock in the morning to 8 p.m. because this was in the spring, right? So it wasn't super warm. And it took a picture every minute from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. for all three days. And we actually got more of our snake photos on that mode mm. than the motion sensor mode. Can you roughly say how many you would have gotten over a space of a day like that? How many photos? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sorry. I meant actually of snakes, like not just pictures. I'm just so. I think that's just like an amazing method, yeah. methodology, that hasn't always been around, right? Yeah. For scientists. I don't know how many pictures we would have gotten per day. I'm not really sure. Yeah. No, that's that's cool. That's, I was curious about that. I thought there was more than one mode. Yeah. Good question. Probably Stefano, I'm thinking. Um, with the bats and the, the fungal disease that many of them harbor, I'm trying to figure out how that works because if they're, do they migrate? They migrate south. So then they're not bringing it back from where they're migrating to. It must be the, the fungus or fungal activity must in the home location, I call it the mother location. Yeah. So. So what do you think it is like, or what do they know? <coughs> so they are migrating. Um, so I guess there's a question in the question, which is, are bats hibernating in Boston's National Park? And we don't know. Um, so we don't really know much about where uh, the bats we have go in winter. We actually have do. Sorry, we have some. I guess. Uh, there are information that may suggest that we might have overwintering site in the park, and an exceptional hibernation site may be a snake den. Or Morris's uh, elevator. Because <laughs> <Yeah, true. laughs> well, yeah. there's anyway, definitely bats the in there. <laughs> One thing is that uh, if we do have migratory species, they might bring the disease from uh, their overwintering site into. Um, their summer ranges, and the other thing. Um, but you just said that Saskatchewan is not known to have it. Correct. So we don't have it yet, as being not as that's not being detected at this time. But we don't know what is going to happen. Uh, is detected as close as Wyoming right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we do suspect it may show up at some point. So if your question was how is it moving, is because of movements of bats and also movements, unfortunately, of people. So people that do exploration of caves, they actually have documented to bring um, fungal infection, fungus basically, through their gear into different caves. And actually, I don't know if you could notice uh, the picture, um, but there's a huge jump in the distribution of the disease that uh, could be only explained by people uh, and actually have been proved uh, to be uh, caused by humans and that's uh, and that's like a major concern I think for um, for bad conservation in general we need to kind of watch out um, and in fact we uh, see here in Washington there's a huge gap so that's most likely not a bat moving, that's probably people that have been uh, going somewhere in an infected area and then went back, do some caving and that have been discovered. So there's a combination of factors and actually now there are best management practices and incredibly strict regulation for uh, people that do work in caves and even that are work on bats about the contamination of gear and also of equipment to really limit the spread of the disease that might occur no matter what. So there's, there's a disinfection kind of procedure protocol? Yeah, it's basically the contamination protocol. And now people are doing a lot of research into methods to control the disease. We actually, I haven't had a picture there, but we were taking uh, swabs on the wings uh, of the bats, uh, not only to sample DNA, but also to collect uh, biological material that may be used to develop um, basically tools to prevent spread of the disease. So a lot of research is going to this, 
but is moving very fast. So you have to be lucky, you have to be quick, and you have to limit touch pad at the disease. And even just uh, if you're going in an area and uh, you have a bat in your, uh, in, you know, in your uh, counter, for example, there are actually methods that you can help uh, to prevent um, spreading the disease. So think about you taking a bat from an infected site with you in a camper and going camping in Grasslands National Park, the bat goes up and that can be already a mechanism of vector for spreading the infection. So there's a growing knowledge about this. Again, you have to be quick. I hope I answered the question. Mm -hmm. well, I have no questions, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. How do you do the mist netting exactly? And like, what time of day are you doing this at? And does it have any impact on the bats? Um, okay. And I just want to clarify that I am a mineral bat biologist. I was lucky to work. Uh, we had contracted a bat biologist working with us. And because it takes a lot of experience, actually, <clears throat> to properly set the nets, handle the bats. <clears throat> so, uh, Answer your question, what do you do? <clears throat> you do it at night, strictly at night. You basically are setting, um, as you can see, there's a pole right here, and there's going to be a line either along this side and then along the water. So you're basically trying to predict where bats will move to forage. Often, what they will do is actually fly and go along the water and then come up. So you're trying to intercept them as they are foraging. Same happens here, there's a one point here, there's actually a line of math here and a line of math here that you can see. They are very, 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 very thin um, mesh, um, basically mesh right here. So the bat as it's flying it goes and you get trapped into the net. And you are checking the net very, very often to uh, ensure the stress is minimal. Uh, it takes practice and I am still very terrible at it, but biologists are very good. You actually have to disentangle the little bat. The earlier you get it, the easier it is because it's less entangled. They will actually start chewing the net to get off, so it's good you don't break your net. Um, and as soon as you've done that, you take them, put them in a small bag, let them yes, cool off for a little bit, and then you actually are processing the animals like here and measuring, as you can see here, the bat wing span and uh, ask the bat to do very funny faces <laughs> and then once all the measurements are taken you can release the bat sometimes you need to warm the bat like a little bit you warm up the bat because it's been sitting for an hour um, so it takes a while for the bat to actually be able to fly effectively uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it so you handle them for about an hour or so? Or the well no, you, you leave them cool off for up to an hour but then handling time can be as fast as 3 minutes it usually depends if the, class, like, the identification of the animal is easy. Uh, for me, it's still very difficult for this guy. They, oh yeah, little brown one is okay. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it takes longer. Actually, this animal that I showed you right here, uh, this one right here, this is the small foot in my uh, This took a while because uh, the identification of bats is about precise measurements. It's about, uh, and even bat experts are actually sometimes questioning themselves, which was very interesting to watch. Um, <laughs> so that took a little bit longer, and I can just give you the gossip that uh, this bat was processing the vehicle because we didn't want them to escape, because it was the new, uh, I guess, record of the species being to Saskatchewan. <laughs> so it was very important, and again, the bat would say, I'm going to take this into the vehicle, and I'm going to process it there. So, that, that just fact. So the reason that you're measuring the wingspan in the past picture there was um, just for identification purposes then? Yeah, most of the time is for that reason. Uh, it's also for collecting um, information, like data, that can be used in the long run, but often the presence uh, of a keel, the, line, the length, like the you know, size of the wings, uh, etc., are used for identification species. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. How far south do burn owls go? Well, the population that we have here in the park, they don't go as far south as Texas and north central Mexico. There are other populations, though, that don't mix with ours at all. Like, there's one in Florida, and there's also another one in South America. But ours are known to go down in Mexico. What about the ones that are in the Okanagan? Are they the same family? Um, they are the same subspecies. And I don't know about their migration at okay. all. Um, and actually, I'm not even sure if... I know they reintroduced. Do you know if they're still there? They're in, like, in a soyuz. Oh, they are? Yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure if they had successfully... 
Apparently they have. Yeah, it is the same subspecies. Okay. I have the same question. Um, I'm just wondering if hibernaculum availability has any effect on the snakes. Is it a limiting factor at all? Hibernaculum. Like, hole availability, kind of. Um, you mean like the availability of the holes on the populations? Yeah, like, do we have too few?